My name is Janie Gordon, and I'm with the Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center. And on behalf of the center and the Maryland Department of Health and Mel Mental Hygiene, I want to welcome everyone to today's presentation, our July Public Health Grand Rounds, Walk This Way, Making a Pedestrian Safety Campaign Memorable. And before we get started, I have a few announcements. For people who are watching online, please check out our archive Grand Rounds and other online trainings. For those watching online, you can email a question for today's presenters anytime during the presentation or after by just clicking on the link, or you can send your email to maphtc at jhu.edu. With that, we're ready for our presentation, Walk This Way, Making a Pedestrian Safety Campaign Memorable. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Um, speaking first will be Bala Akundi, and he is a principal transportation engineer with the Baltimore Metropolitan Council, which provides technical support to the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Baltimore region. He's part of the policy team working on management and operations, congestion management, traffic signal operations, intelligent transportation systems, and freight movement and safety. Mr. Akunde has a master's degree in transportation engineering from Virginia Tech and has over 20 years of experience in traffic and engineering analysis and design, transportation planning studies, travel demand modeling, traffic data collection and analysis, and intelligent transportation systems, which I like the sound of that, intelligent transportation systems. Prior to joining, the Baltimore Metropolitan Council in 2003. He worked as a senior traffic engineer at Parsons Transportation Group, URS, and Daniel Consultants, Inc. He is a member of the Urban Freight Transportation Committee of the Transportation Research Board and serves on the board of the Intelligent Transportation Society of America. Andrea Gielen, our second speaker is the director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Injury Research and Policy and a faculty member in the Hopkins Center for the Prevention of Youth Violence. She's a professor in the Department of Health, Behavior, and Society with joint appointments in population, family, and reproductive health, and health policy and management. Dr. Gielen earned a Master and Doctor of Science degree from Johns Hopkins University her research interests are in the development and evaluation of community and clinic-based programs that address health behavior problems affecting women and children, primarily among low-income families in urban areas. The application of behavioral sciences to childhood injury control and domestic violence prevention programs and the relationship between violence and HIV risk are areas of special focus. Childhood injury problems of particular interest are fires, carbon monoxide poisoning, and motor vehicle crashes. Dr. Gielen has received many awards throughout her career. To name just a few recent ones, in 2013, she received the American Public Health Association Award for Excellence, and in 2012, she was named one of 20 for 20 distinguished leaders in injury prevention by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Mr. Akundi. Thank you so much, uh, Janie, and thank you very much for having us here today. Um, greatly appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of the work that we've been doing in the Baltimore region to promote uh, pedestrian safety in particular. Uh, we're taking a very active role the agency is in promoting safety in general, but we have done um, a significant amount of work um, thanks to um, folks like Dr. Galen and the Maryland Highway Safety Office. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the last five, six years to promote pedestrian safety. So before I go deep into my presentation, let me tell you who we are, um, the Baltimore Metropolitan Council. Um, we are an organization of the region's elected officials. Um, the region represents Baltimore City and the five surrounding counties. And what we do, um, we identify regional interests uh, towards improving the quality of life and economic vitality in the region. We have several different areas within our organization, air and water quality programs, 
building permit data systems, computer mapping, and where I come in is in that last bullet there, transportation planning. We have a, a fairly um, large transportation planning staff that do anything from travel demand modeling to air quality analysis, freight analysis, and safety. You also see this other um, logo on my slides here, the BRTB. The BRTB is the Baltimore Regional Transportation Board, and it's a federally designated metropolitan planning organization for the Baltimore region. And our primary function as the MPO is making sure that money spent on existing and future transportation projects, it's based on this continuing cooperative and comprehensive planning process. So every four years, we produce a document called the Long Range Plan, which has a, a, a listing of all major highway and transit projects that require federal funding between now and the future year of 2035. Right now, our current plan goes out to the year 2035. We're working on updating our plan, um, updating a plan to the year 2040. And it's called Maximize 2040. So um, if you go to our website, you'll see lots of information on, on these types of uh, planning activities. Just a quick um, slide about the Baltimore region. I'm sure you all know about this already. We're the uh, nation's 19th largest market with over two and a half million people. It ranks in the top 20 uh, for household sales, buying income, and again, these are the six jurisdictions that represent the Baltimore metropolitan region. So now I'll get into a little bit of the, um, the crash statistics. Um, and, and so uh, as I've been telling folks, um, up until about 2004-2005 when um, I got involved in the statewide strategic highway safety plan, I had no idea that in, in Maryland we have almost 500 fatalities every year. Um, and this includes all types of um, fatalities, um, impaired driving, aggressive driving, uh, unbelted um, drivers, passengers. But then when you look at the Baltimore region, which represents these six jurisdictions, um, we are almost 40, 45% of the statewide total. So we do have a fairly large share of um, the uh, fatalities that are happening across our um, highway network. And if you look at the number of injuries, and this is a five-year period spanning 2009 to 2013, the Baltimore region accounts for almost 48% of statewide injuries, and Baltimore City has the highest number of injuries in any given year. If you look at the numbers at the bottom, um, you'll see Baltimore City um, in the 7,000 range almost every year. And going back to fatalities for a second, um, last year in 2013, we saw the the fewest number of fatalities across the state, 456, over the last 50 years or so. But while overall fatalities have continued to decline, and, and we are very happy to see that trend, um, the one area in which we are seeing an alarming increase is in the number of pedestrian fatalities, and which is why we are spending a lot of our um, efforts focusing on education um, to reduce those numbers. So again, you know, um, this is something that I, I took from the uh, NHTSA website. NHTSA is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Um, they have a lot of material and resources that um, they provide to um, uh, states and MPOs and lots of um, other groups that would like to take advantage of these types of educational material. So this thing you know, struck me because it's true. I mean, while I may not be walking specifically to, to go anywhere, you know, in the morning when I go to work, I park my car and go walk into the office. So I'm a pedestrian at least for a part of the, my commute, and, and that's true of almost everybody, I think. And, and so when you look at pedestrian crashes in particular, and this is data from 2012 from NHTSA, um, over 4,700 people, pedestrians, were killed, in, and an estimated 76,000 were injured. And when you translate that to the number, like a daily number, that's two pedestrians killed every two hours. And, set, um, and a pe pedestrian injured every seven minutes in traffic crashes. And that's a staggering number uh, when you think about it. Uh, about 10 years ago, across the nation, we had over 40,000 highway fatalities. We're down to about 32,000 now. Um, and again, that's because of the collective efforts of various uh, partners in reducing those numbers. And again, looking at some more national statistics, um, three quarters of these pedestrian fatalities occurred in urban settings. Like, like the Baltimore metropolitan region, Baltimore City, and the surrounding counties. And, and several of these, over, uh, over two-thirds of these, occurred at non-intersections versus at intersections. So these are people that are crossing mid-block um, and, and getting hit. 89% of pedestrian fatalities occurred during 
regular normal weather conditions, clear cloudy days compared to rain or snow. And a majority of these pedestrian fatalities occurred during the nighttime between the hours of 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. <clears throat> so now I wanted to share some um, uh, data specific to the Baltimore region on, on pedestrian fatalities. And again, I'm using the same five-year period between 2009 and 2013. Um, so again, here you see that the Baltimore statewide, we have roughly over 100 pedestrian fatalities, and, and the Baltimore region accounts for almost 45% of those. So in 2013, if you were to look at the last column, the region had 52 pedestrian fatalities. Statewide, we had 116. And if you look at the individual jurisdictions, Baltimore County and Baltimore City um, lead the region. And, and what we are really concerned about is what's happening in Baltimore County, where it went from 14 pedestrian fatalities in 2012 to 22 in 2013. And, and likewise, Baltimore City had a, had a good trend there between 2009 and 2012, but then we, we saw an increase in 2012. So um, there's several of us working to address this um, situation and um, education, enforcement, engineering. Um, there are um, four E's that are the key um, uh, elements of a, a good plan, engineering, education, enforcement, and emergency medical services. And, and where we come in as, as our agency uh, is mostly on the education side, but we do also have a role to play on the engineering side. And again, a quick snapshot of um, injuries in the Baltimore region. Uh, the Baltimore region accounts for almost 60% of pedestrian injuries. But again, Baltimore City, as you can see, in the 800 to 900 um, range there. So what are we doing about it? Um, Maryland has a Strategic Highway Safety Plan, or SHSP, as it's commonly referred to. Um, the current plan is uh, from 2011 to 2015. And, and collectively, there are several partners that are uh, part of this effort. It's a team effort led by the Maryland Highway Safety Office, which is part of the Motor Vehicle Administration. And, and Tom Gianni is the head of the Maryland Highway Safety Office, so he has a team of staff, and they put together a, a very strong coalition of safety partners, including state police and, and various other groups, and came up with this um, approach to take a, a strategic approach to the safety problem. And, and so as part of that, we came up with these six emphasis areas that are most critical. And so the six are aggressive driving, distracted driving, highway infrastructure, impaired driving, occupant prote protection, and pedestrians. And then we have these um, seven target groups across the top, children, young drivers, high-risk drivers, older drivers, motorcycles, trucks and buses, and bicyclists. And, and feeding all of that from the bottom is data. Data is very critical to what we do to solve this problem. So again, we have a lot of um, partners, a lot of um, very qualified people who um, dissect the data and provide us with the necessary information and, and again, you have public outreach, communication, education, law, uh, loss and law enforcement, and highway planning, engineering, and design to um, help support this matrix. And the goal um, of the Strategic Highway Safety Plan, and Maryland is one of those states that signed on to um, uh, something called Towards Zero Debts, or TZD. And uh, so we're working towards that, but we set ourselves a goal to reduce fatalities and injuries by half by the year 2030, so you'll see on the next couple of slides, this is the fatality goal as, a, as a, an entire state to um, have a, a total number of fatalities down to 274 by the year 2030. We are actually a little bit ahead of, um, of our target uh, for 2015 with the 430 or so fatalities that we had statewide last year. Same thing with injuries, um, our target is about 24,000 by the year 2030. So within the Strategic Highway Safety Plan, as I uh, showed you earlier, there is a pedestrian emphasis area. And that particular group has established a specific set of objectives and strategies. So their objectives are to reduce the annual number of pedestrian fatalities on all roads in Maryland from 115 in 2008 to fewer than 92 by December 31st. That's a 19.8% reduction. And same thing with injuries, a similar goal of 16.8% to um, bring them down to about 2,000. And some of the strategies that this group is putting in, putting together or working on right now is having processes in place to identify high crash, high incident locations and corridors. And again, I'll share, share some of that information with you in, in um, some slides that are coming up. Um, 
having uh, approaches of engineering the built environment. I think one of the challenges we're seeing is some of the older cars were, were built entirely um, around the automobile. So pedestrian accommodations have not been a part of that process. So now we are going back and trying to re-engineer some of those older corridors or environments to accommodate pedestrians and bicyclists. And in fact, as there are some cities, Chicago I think is a good example, that actually prioritized accommodations for um, bicyclists and pedestrians over automobiles in some, some areas. So we're not there yet, but we're working towards that. So what we're doing, that, that was, uh, that was an, uh, a quick snapshot, snapshot of what's happening at the statewide level. At the regional level, as part of the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, our board formed a regional safety subcommittee in um, 2008 as a direct follow-up to the um, previous strategic highway safety plan and um, asked the committee to, to come up with programs and uh, processes that would help improve safety in the Baltimore metropolitan region. So we have... Um, this committee that's chaired by Captain John McKissick from Howard County, and it brings, brings together representatives from the four E's, engineering, education, enforcement, and EMS, um, from each of the jurisdictions and the state and federal agencies that are part of this um, process. And several of us are active on other emphasis area teams as well. So for example, Captain McKissick, who is the chair of our subcommittee, is also, the, um, is also an active member of Occupant Protection. He's actually the chair of the Occupant Protection team. Um, I'm actively involved on the highway infrastructure emphasis area team. And what that does is it helps bring, make those connections between the various emphasis area teams so we're not each working in isolation. We work collectively to um, solve this problem. The Regional Safety Subcommittee and, and staff at BMC, we focus primarily on education and building partnerships. So since 2008, we've spent um, a little over a, a million dollars um, on promoting pedestrian uh, safety campaign called Street Smart, um, specific to the Baltimore region. We also had a distracted driving campaign between 2008 and 2010. As you all probably know, distraction is becoming a huge problem. So um, we're trying to raise the level of awareness with, with some of those programs as well. We also support um, the statewide motorcycle safety uh, coalition, bicycle groups, and several local safety task forces. And something that we did um, several years ago um, is to be able to get better access to data and to be able to visualize crash data, um, University of Maryland helped create a, a web-based data analysis tool, which is called EBC, for use by local jurisdictions. But now we don't use that as much. We have access to other resources um, that we um, go out to and have them help uh, analyze the data for us. So now coming to the regional pedestrian safety campaign, um, you know, as I showed you on those data slides, the Baltimore region accounts for almost 45% of statewide pedestrian fatalities and almost 55% of the statewide pedestrian injuries. And um, again, I pointed this out earlier, Baltimore County saw a sharp increase and we're starting to get concerned about some of the other trends going in the wrong direction. So the Highway Safety Office approached us in 2009 to implement this campaign called Street Smart in the Baltimore region. And, and we were happy to do that uh, with some funding support from them. We brought essentially what was working really well in the metropolitan Washington region. In fact, the two jurisdictions that you don't see on here because they're not part of the Baltimore region are Prince George's and Montgomery counties. And those are the two jurisdictions that also have a, a high number of pedestrian fatalities and crashes. You may have heard about the, uh, the woman who was killed in College Park just last week. And, and so they're having um, a, a fairly large problem on their hands as well. Um, so we brought the Street Smart campaign, which first began in D.C., in, in the D.C. region in 2002. Um, we brought that to the Baltimore region in 2009, and this, this was essentially a, a mass media campaign to put out um, public service announcements on radio and television. And we added some elements later on that, uh, that are now a staple of our current campaign, and I'll, I'll talk about those in a second. So the 2014 campaign goals, and they have essentially remained um, the same since the campaign began in 2009, may have um, made some minor adjustments along the way. Um, are the, the goals of the campaign are to change motorist, pedestrian, and bicyclist behavior, thereby reducing the number of pedestrian and bicyclist deaths and injuries. And it's essentially a public awareness campaign. And what we're doing now is focusing on high crash corridors, and that's why I highlighted that in red there. Um, 
because again, you know, we, we can't be everywhere and we, we only have limited resources, um, we are trying to focus our efforts to those areas that have the highest need, where there is a, a crash history that um, has multiple fatalities over a two or three or four, four year period. And something else that we have been um, doing and it's, it's, it's building more uh, support and momentum is combining education with enforcement. And it's been a little bit of a challenge because as officers will tell you in Baltimore City, and I think they've said that to you as well, and guys, they have other priorities, competing priorities. Uh, they have uh, drugs and homicides and several other things. So um, spending some of that time towards pedestrian and driver um, law enforcement is a little bit of a challenge for them, but, but they are, they're at the table and they're willing to help um, partners um, promoting this campaign and, and thereby reducing the, um, the crashes and fatalities. So what we did this past cycle is in a on April 18th, we launched our campaign in Anne Arundel County along Maryland 2 and Maryland 648. These are um, high pedestrian crash corridors, and I'll show you maps that you may not be able to see all the details clearly, but I have some details on how we came up with those maps. Um, we added street teams. These are representatives, the like teams of four or five people that um, were essentially the creative that we use for our campaigns. And they go out and canvas neighborhoods, canvas the corridors, handing out pedestrian safety information. And, and that's been very successful in reaching out to the pedestrians in particular along these corridors. Uh, the mass media communication transit, outdoor advertisements, we use billboards, we, we use gas pump toppers, which have become a very popular way to get the, the message out. As, as we all stop to pump gas, you're, you're looking at the gas pump, instead you could be looking at a message. So we've been using that quite a bit. Um, we are also reaching out through digital media and social media. And um, more recently, we've started going out to festivals where there's a large number of pedestrians. Um, Towson Town Festival recently, we were there. Uh, we'll be going up to Harford County in September um, to what they have, um, what they call as Healthy Harford Day. These maps are a little bit hard to read, um, but we get these from uh, the State Highway Administration and the Highway Safety Office. These are um, crash maps for Anne Arundel and Baltimore counties. And if you, if you can see those re red dots on those maps, um, and I'll try to point this out here, there we go. So if you see those, th those are segments where there have been one or more pedestrian fatalities in, the la in, in this time frame between 2009 and 2011. So using, uh, and, and same thing with Baltimore County, there are several corridors out here in the Randallstown area. Liberty Road is something that we've focused our attention on quite a bit. Um, and then again, on, on the um, east side of Baltimore County, there are several corridors. So using data-driven approaches, we reach out to those high crash corridors and areas to target our message. And it also helps law enforcement. We provide the same information to law enforcement so they can go out there and enforce laws. Um, here is a, a map that you may recognize. This is Baltimore City, uh, a half a mile radius um, around 33rd and St. Paul, where there have been um, um, multiple pedestrian crashes. And we use that information to deploy street teams to these areas. So the, the creative has evolved over time. So when we first started out in 2009, like I said, we used information from the DC region. So we took essentially what they had out in the, in the Washington market and used it in the Baltimore market. So across like your life depends on it was the uh, catchphrase that we used for our campaign back in 2009, continued that through 2011. In 2012, we used this, um, this graphic um, where we were trying to relay the, um, the importance of watching speed, especially um, on streets like um, we have around here and around campus. Um, and you know, it, it just again, I think it's a very clear message, a very powerful message. Uh, we use that for, uh, for a cycle or two. And, and the thing with these, and, and I know Andrea is gonna talk about this, uh, we need feedback. We, we get feedback through surveys and other, um, other uh, ways and we modify our message over time. So you know, some people don't like these types of um, visuals. Other people um, like them because it makes you change your behavior. Um, and this is an example of what the street teams um, look like when they're out canvassing uh, these high crash corridors and neighborhoods. They have these backpacks that they wear. Um, so you can't miss them. They wear these bright fluorescent green shirts and I'm sure Andrea will talk about this. They were here for a press event that Hopkins had um, last month or two months ago. And the, and the 
the bottom right hand corner is um, something that was done at the um, other Hopkins campus with the Rhodes Scholar campaign. In 2013, last year, uh, we took the creative from a very successful campaign that was launched in Ocean City, Maryland, uh, where they used the, the crab as the mascot to, uh, to convey the safety message. And uh, we, we, we thought it would translate well to the Baltimore region as well with you know, Old Bay and everything else that we have here. Um, so we used that. Um, and we also took this creative and this campaign to um, certain schools in the Baltimore region. So using um, the, the creative from 2012 would have been a little bit of a challenge for us to take it to kids, for example. That audience would, would not receive that well. And I can't thank um, uh, Dr. Galen and her staff and, and her team for coming up with our 2014 creative. We were part of that team. We were invited to uh, sit in on those meetings as they were developing their creative, and we thought it was perfect. We, you know, we really liked the way they approached it, and so we decided we would adopt rather than coming up with a new creative. And and um, because it's part of Baltimore City. Uh, we thought we could apply it all across the Baltimore region. So um, it's worked really well. We've taken uh, these messages and used them in all of the jurisdictions in our region, essentially, and, and on radio and, um, uh, and through other forms of media. This is a quick snapshot of what we did um, at the Towson Town Festival. We had our street team members out there handing out, again, safety information. We pass out reflectors that people can use. One of the things that we... Um, um, tell pedestrians is to wear um, bright colored clothing when they go out at night. Um, you know, hopefully that message is coming through, but if they don't have bright colored clothing, wearing something that refl that's reflective, and hopefully these reflectors will help. Uh, they, they're not forever, but they at least get you through a few months. And this is, um, again, um, right here outside of, um, of your campus. Something that we did a couple of years ago, um, when we have these street teams going out within, uh, to a neighborhood, uh, we try to impress upon the, the general public that this is happening right in your neighborhood. This is not something that happens 50 miles away from you. This is happening right in your neighborhood. So this, this talks about how many pedestrians were killed around those three corridors in Baltimore City. And uh, this is the front of the card. This is the back of the card with the safety tips that we um, provide to both drivers and pedestrians. Now, you know, again, we've targeted this message to everybody, not just to the pedestrians. This is aimed at drivers, um, and the way we do it for drivers is through billboards and radio and TV PSAs. We've also used our elected officials who are our board members to help promote these campaigns. So this was the launch of the 2011 campaign in Howard County outside of the Columbia Mall with the County Executive Ken Ullman and uh, Police Chief um, McMahon. We also did a PSA last year with help from uh, the Orioles. We used the Oriole Bird to uh, have a, a PSA uh, put out there on, on, on local television stations. And um, unfortunately, I can't play this for you right now because it doesn't work so well. But um, it's available on our website, bemorestreetsmart.com. Some, some of the types of infrastructure improvements we're looking at, and I'll give you the example of um, the Maryland Safety Corridor um, that we that we work closely with State Highway. This is not something that BMC did um, ourselves, but we work very closely with um, State Highway Administration. And, and this corridor has um, a crash history, 11 fatalities over a three-year, four-year period, 2,900 crashes. Um, so what State Highway and, and all of us did collectively, we put together a team of partners that included State Highway, we, it included the Maryland Transit Administration, uh, State Police, Baltimore County Police, City, Baltimore City, public schools, and um, just again to give you an idea, this is an old corridor with a center turn lane, um, establishment, business establishments on one side, residences on the other side, people crossing, um, mid-block, unsignalized, several unsignalized intersections and driveways, uh, which is where most of these crashes have occurred. So we put together a program where we went out there and, and did the education through Street Smart. We, had, um, we also had auto, the auto, that AAA, uh, it's a program that trip, AAA runs where they take this little talking car to school so that the kids can learn how to cross the street safely. Um, and again, you know, reaching out to businesses, community associations. Some of the engineering countermeasures, um, several of these older corridors don't have continuous sidewalks. They, they have um, segments that are missing, so people are forced to walk on the street. So by providing that continuity, um, you make the environment much, much safer. 
um, having median treatments, and, and this was part of a resurfacing project that SHA was able to take advantage of, uh, not just purely going out there to make these safety fixes, but while resurfacing was being done, they were able to go um, put some of these safety measures in place, and it also included some lighting upgrades. Something else that happened there over time, there were several bus stop locations at the request of either the citizens or um, the community, and um, when we took a closer look at it, we realized that you don't need so many bus stops in such close, close proximity to each other. So working with the public and working with the Maryland Trans Transit Administration, we consolidated bus stops. And this is just to give you, again, an example of how this, this is something that cannot be solved just purely by educating or enforcement. You have to combine education, enforcement, and um, bringing all the partners together. So we'll be going out again uh, with our campaign in August and September. We are starting to engage more schools and universities and grassroots organizations as part of this effort. Uh, we continue to work with um, uh, data and, and how, to, how best to analyze the data and where to um, put our limited resources. And, and just working again with partners such as Hopkins and others to uh, promote safety in the region. And I think with that, um, at the end of my presentation. Thank you, Jenny. You have this one. Oh, okay. Oh, we didn't open it. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the um, opportunity to be here and talk about the project, and um, thank you to Bala for his um, great presentation and um, participation in the program that I'm going to be describing here. Um, before I start uh, talking about our specific pedestrian project, um, I want to just give you a quick background on the Injury Center for people who are not familiar with the center. Um, our goal is to close the gap between research and practice to reduce the burden of injury, and we do that in three ways. One, by conducting research that informs policies and programs that improve people's lives, hopefully, by reducing injuries and improving treatment, and translating that research into practice and making sure that our, um, our research is always integrated with practice needs. Um, and then incorporating research and practice into the education of injury professionals. Um, and we have a number of courses that are available to students here and to the public um, in general. <clears throat> Um, so our center was one of the first centers for excellence in injury research in the country, funded by the Centers for Disease Control, starting in 1987 under the leadership of Professor Sue Baker, who I'm sure is familiar to many of you. Um, it's the home to 24 core, 25 core faculty and 40 to 50 affiliated and collaborating faculty from inside and outside of the university. Um, we have many different disciplines represented. As you could hear in the earlier talk, injury prevention is a multidisciplinary activity with in people who study engineering, law, policy, epidemiology, behavioral sciences, et cetera. Um, and we rely on multiple sources of funding to do the work that we do. Um, we take a public health focus to injury as a public health problem. And I hope many of you think about injury as, as one of the public health problems that needs your expertise. Um, and by taking a public health perspective, I mean that we focus on populations and we are comprehensive in our approach. And let me just say a couple of more words about both of those points. In terms of populations, I'm not allowed to leave the Injury Center without bringing this chart, because um, uh, every audience, there's someone who hasn't seen it yet. Um, it's the 10 leading causes of death in the U.S. Um, in 20. 10, with the rank order um, from 1 to 10 on the left, and the age groups from left to right um, across the population. And you don't need to read the words here, but look at the colors of the boxes. The blue boxes are unintentional injury, the red boxes are homicides, and the green boxes are suicide. So it tells a compelling story of the impact of injury on the population. It's the leading cause of death from ages 1 to 44, and overall, the fifth leading cause of death is unintentional injury. And when you add in suicide and homicide, it rises to the third leading cause of death in the United States. 
So how do we approach this problem? Like any other public health problem, we conduct surveillance, risk factor identification, intervention development and testing, and translation and dissemination. And all, we focus on many different aspects, including all of those in the injury center um, across our, our faculty. We focus on primary prevention to acute care and rehabilitation. Um, and we also adopt the three E's, but I should say the fourth E now uh, as well, um, in terms of of an approach to solving this problem requires engineering, enforcement, education, um, as well as emergency medical care. So that's a brief background or context in which um, our group began working on this pedestrian safety problem. And the initiative for this came from the university leadership who was concerned about pedestrian injuries around the Hopkins campuses, um, both on the Homewood campus and on the East Baltimore campus. Um, and so the Injury Center was asked to help design some solutions and strategies. And in order to do that, we did an, a variety of activities uh, um, that would fall under the general idea of needs assessment, um, or as Bala said, you know, being data driven. So it, just like you need data to look at where crashes are happening, you should be data and evidence driven in developing um, your messages and, and strategies. So we did a variety of things, looking at crash data, we conducted online surveys, we did videotaping of how people are actually crossing intersections, um, and we did focus groups. And we, de we designed some strategies, working working very closely with the folks on Homewood campus initially who, who developed the Road Scholar campaign, which you saw a, a picture from earlier. Um, and then we also did um, a lot more work over here on the East Baltimore campus. Um, and we've, uh, the university has been working to implement engineering, enforcement, and educational activities on both campuses. Um, and I don't have time to focus on all of that. Um, so what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk is um, answering the question that the um, name of this seminar um, uh, put out there, Walk This Way, How to Make a Campaign Memorable. So I'm going to be focusing on the social marketing campaign that we did that was based on our audience analysis here on the East Baltimore campus, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the formative research program design, implementation, and evaluation of that um, campaign. So first and foremost is our collaborators who represent a spectrum of the multiple disciplines in injury prevention. Um, from the Injury Center, um, Keisha Pollack, I'm particularly, I'm grateful for her to her for many things, but in particular for introducing us um, to the Baltimore Metropolitan Council and, and Bala, who's been a wonderful um, teammate. Um, Mary Ann Bailey, a research associate, Eileen McDonald, associate scientist, and Sue Baker, um, all from the Injury Center. And then we were very fortunate to be able to um, um, have Jim Williams uh, join us as a social marketing consultant. He um, um, had a long uh, career at the Cent uh, Center for Communication Programs, or CCP. Um, so he joined us along with Mark B Besser, the graphic designer from CCP. And then we were particularly appreciative of getting some funding um, from Ernie Lair at the Maryland Highway Safety Office, um, and then Bala, who you have met and um, has been an instrumental in the work that I'm going to present. And then really, really importantly is um, the support of senior leadership of the school and of the university. Um, and Jane Schlegel, who is our senior associate dean here at the school, as well as other um, leaders across the university, formed a pedestrian safety task force representing may, many of the stakeholders, um, including the um, security people, the transportation people, um, the community relations people, government affairs, et cetera. So um, none of what I'm going to present would have been possible without all of, um, all of the input and expertise from this um, team and others. So in terms of the formative research, um, we first looked at pedestrian incident reports and videos from Hopkins security to look at what, what was actually happening um, when people were getting hit or there were near misses around our campus. We also um, uh, obtained data from the National Study Center at the University of Maryland, Baltimore City Department of Transportation, and Maryland Highway Safety Office. Um, as I mentioned, we videotaped high-risk intersections during peak times, and we conducted an online survey and focus groups with the 
intended audience. Um, and for this particular example, the intended audience are the Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions um, on this campus, faculty, students, and staff, as well as East Baltimore community residents who travel through this area on a regular basis. And I'm going to talk about the um, one a couple of things that we learned from looking at how the crashes happen and where they happen and how people are walking, just to keep in mind um, as we go through this. Um, we found that left turns, when people are turning left and pedestrians are crossing um, at the same time, that's a dangerous um, <laughs> that's a dangerous situation. Um, we also found many people were walking with their headphones on or texting or talking on the phone. Another danger situation. Um, so we were able to actually see a lot of what was happening that could put people um, at high risk. And one of the things that happened early on um, was there was a, we were able to get a delay in the signal um, at the intersection right out here, which was the biggest um, concern where, as I said, people were, drivers were turning left and pedestrians were crossing. So there's now a five second delay on that light so that pedestrians get a head start. Um, so that, that was sort of background. And then we did the online survey and the focus groups. And I'm going to talk about the results of those because they led to the messaging that you saw that we're using. So we had 3,818 respondents from uh, sending out an online survey um, here at the Hopkins institutions. Three quarters of those were employees, and 80% of them traveled to campus four or more times per week. And right away, we were staggered to get such a wonderful response um, because we've done other surveys, and you really you're you're lucky if you get a few hundred. So I think this is an important issue that resonates with people. Um, we also had 81 respondents who were East Baltimore residents um, who also walked and drove around here a little less often than our um, employees. But should also bear in mind that a lot of employees, there are many employees who also live around here, so it's not exactly. Um, clean in that way. Um, three quarters of the respondents were females and ranged from 18 to 90 years old with an average age of 37. And the car was the most common form of transportation, um, followed by the bus or shuttle. So what did they tell us about their experience as a pedestrian? We asked if you had ever been struck or struck a pedestrian or had a near miss. And what this slide shows is um, that uh, over 40% said yes, they'd either been struck or had a near miss. Most of it is near misses in the light blue bar here. Um, and if we, when we asked about having struck a pedestrian, um, we saw that almost, I guess, about 17% said yes, they had struck a pedestrian or had a near miss. Again, um, e even more of that in this case is uh, near misses. But it's something that resonated with people that they had some experience with. This is, this. we asked, how big a problem do you think the pedestrian injuries are um, in and around the campus here? And you can see virtually everybody, 99% said it was important or very important. And you can see a, a large proportion of that was very important. So then we asked, who contributes most to this problem? Mostly drivers, mostly pedestrians, or both equally? And what this, what this shows is the vast majority of responses, over 70%, said both drivers and pedestrians were equally responsible for the problem. So from the surveys, and I can't, I'm not sharing all the results, obviously, but in general, this is what we took away from the surveys, was that people were very familiar with the issue, some with personal experience. It was already perceived to be an important problem, and it was perceived to be a shared responsibility between drivers and pedestrians. This is important information when thinking about a message strategy, because it would be a completely different situation if no one thought what you thought was important was important. You'd have a whole different strategy to think about, but we were in some ways advantaged because people already were aware of this as a problem. Um, we also asked some questions about what would be useful to do, and law enforcement, um, engineering, and campaigns were all suggested um, by different proportions of the um, respondents. So what we did with those, oops, sorry. 
Um, what we did with those results um, was we supplemented them with a review of the literature and we looked at exemplar programs um, including the Baltimore Metropolitan Council, University of North Carolina, and Washington DC. Looked at what they were doing, what their materials and messages were. Um, and we identified three different message strategies with specific creatives. We had one whole strategy around law enforcement which could have a, a message like obey, obey, obey or pay, um, stop, wait, don't tempt fate. Um, we had another message strategy which had to do with civility to try to get drivers and pedestrians to get along better. Um, don't compete, share the street, the street belongs to everyone, share it, don't wear it. And a third uh, message strategy which was alertness, be seen, be safe, be alert, and don't get hurt. So guess which one we ended up with? <laughs> Let me tell you how we got to that since you've already seen that. Um, so we focus group tested these messages and these creatives with 31 participants, mostly female, about 41 years old, um, all from around here. 78% um, of the people who came to our focus groups had been hit or had a near miss, um, and 45% had hit a pedestrian or had a near miss. So um, a group that really had, had something to say and wanted wanted to be heard. And as a result of that, um, we found that the law enforcement idea, um, people thought, yeah, that's a good idea, but it's never going to work. For the reasons that Bala mentioned, it's not really feasible to get a high level of enforcement um, uh, at this particular time. So that one didn't work too well. Um, the second one with civility was sort of um, also responded to like mom and apple pie, it's a great idea. It's just not going to work. Um, and so then we pursued a little bit more the alertness um, strategy. And folks said that, you know, we all know what to do. We just need to be reminded about what to do. Um, but we need to be reminded in a way that's impactful, that's going to um, make a difference, we're, that we're going to pay attention to. And so in summary, and to develop the campaign, we decided that we would go with a strategic emphasis on alertness, be alert, don't get hurt. People wanted to see the consequences. They want to be able to project themselves into the situation. And, and one way to do that is with dramatic visuals, which people really wanted as long as they weren't too gruesome. Um, and they wanted specific calls to action. Again, getting at this notion that we know what to do, but we forget. So tell us specifically what to do when we need to be doing it. Um, testimonials were also thought to be a really good way to have an impact. Stories of real people like themselves. And statistics were um, thought to be good to communicate. If they were statistics about your neighborhood or your environment or things that were relevant to you. And then finally, something short, memorable, with a colorful logo. So that's the background of how we got to phase one of our campaign, which runs ran from um, February of this year through April of this year. Um, and you can see we went with a stop, wait, go slow, stop, look both ways, wait, watch for drivers, go slow, proceed with caution, be alert, don't get hurt. And we have the same, the same thing for watch for pedestrians. So again, reaching both, trying to reach both the drivers um, and the pedestrians with a simple, straightforward, um, attractive message. In terms of being um, it, um, dramatic, um, I guess would be the word. Um, we also had quite a few uh, dramatic visuals, which you may have seen around here. Um, and if people want to um, send in a note on when you ask questions about whether you've seen any of our materials or heard any of our public service announcements, that'd be great. We'd love to, to know that um, the message is getting out. So this is an example of one of our um, uh, posters, 700 pedestrians will be hit this year in Baltimore. Again, numbers that are relevant to the audience, don't let it be you, a call to action, don't let it be you, stop, wait, and go slow. Uh, 700 drivers in Baltimore will hit a pedestrian this year. Again, reversing the message to um, uh, the driver. 100 pedestrians will be killed this year in Maryland. Um, we, because we were um, going to go region-wide with um, uh, Baltimore Metropolitan Council and because of the interest of the Maryland Highway Safety Office, we had um, also added uh, messages and visuals that could be used um, for a broader audience. Um, but still, all with the same, don't let it be you, stop, wait, go slow, be alert, don't get hurt. 
Um, and here's one that's very specific to our neighborhood, which we only use in this area, which is 12 pedestrians have been injured recently by vehicles around Hopkins and two died. Again, very um, dramatic and impactful. So where you may have seen some of these, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we implemented the campaign. Um, we have sandwich boards. It's important to get the message to the audience in the place they need to see it. Um, this is how they sell us things at the checkout line when we're at the grocery store. So we put the sandwich boards right where people are going to be crossing the street. Um, posters in buildings, table tents, postcards, plasma screens in the, in the university, School of Nursing, School of Public Health, and and School of Medicine all were active participants. Um, Hopkins shuttle and buses, and we also had a number of giveaway items so that people could um, keep, keep that reminder um, close. Um, and that was mostly for pedestrians. In terms of drivers, we put exterior banners on the parking garages, and we put the sandwich boards right by the parking garage pay stations, um, garage elevators on the exit gates, and bumper stickers at the pay stations. Um, and so hopefully you've seen some of these. We, um, we have the reflectors, the bumper stickers, a bag, and a tumbler that we were giving out at community events. Um, this is the uh, sandwich board at an intersection. This is a poster on the shuttle bus, and this is when you go in and out of the garage, this is what you'll see. So really getting the, the message widely spread. And then, then uh, we had the great good fortune of partnering with Baltimore Metropolitan Council to start a phase two. And the idea here was that that was an awareness raising with short messages, but we still hadn't gotten at the testimonials. So we wanted to do um, more intensive messaging as well as um, with the Baltimore Metropolitan Council's help implement the campaign in a broader area. And so um, the Baltimore Metropolitan Council provided resources for radio, Metro, um, more bus posters um, for the circulator, small and large posters, postcards and giveaway items, and then their wonderful street teams that were carrying our message to other, other locations. So we had a launch of this phase two, which was April through um, the end of August, beginning of September. We had a rally. I hope some of you may have seen it or been there. We had speakers and um, from the university, Daniel Ennis from the president of the university's office, Deans Clegg and Davidson, Dean Clegg from here, and Dean Davidson from School of Nursing, um, and myself. And then the Baltimore Metropolitan Council street teams, and we had giveaways, lots of activities, and really we had an amazing amount of of uh, media coverage with all the major stations um, interviewing people, doing street interviews and covering it. So again, that was very good coverage. Um, here's an example of our um, Baltimore-based message that's on the, MT, on the um, uh, Metro board there. And then I want to just tell you a little bit about the testimonial part of it. So here, here are the, the second phase messages that include testimonials. Um, I never saw it coming. Last October, I was casually crossing the street when a 12-ton bus hit me out of nowhere. I spent four months in a coma. I'm still in the hospital but recovering. The bus driver may never recover. I thought she was going to stop. Last June, this lady was ta talking on her cell phone while crossing the street. I thought she saw me coming and would get out of the way. She didn't stop, neither did I. She lost her life. I lost my license, my job, my family life, and my peace of mind forever. I never thought it could happen to me. As I was making a right turn, I saw this guy start to cross the street. I thought I could get through the intersection if I just sped up a little bit. I didn't hit the guy. Instead, I hit a 14-year-old kid who just entered the crosswalk. She spent six days in intensive care with 19 broken bones and a damaged kidney. Then she died. A piece of me died that day as well. Now I'm spending five years in prison for vehicular manslaughter. So again, trying to tell stories that are based on in reality um, and hopefully appealing to people who have been in these situations where just they haven't had a crash, but they've had these experiences where they might have, and they will uh, now think twice about how to, how to uh, prevent this in the future. 
Um, in terms of implementing the second phase, we did 10 second traffic report um, radio spots. Um, uh, Jim estimates we have, you know, the, it, the reach of these things is quite amazing. Over 760,000 listeners a week on these two radio stations that carried our, um, our messages. Um, 25 Charm City circulator buses, over 370,000 riders a month, and on Metro Transit advertising. So really trying to um, spread the word. This is an example of our 10 second radio spot. Johns Hopkins University and the Motor Vehicle Administration urge you to avoid pedestrian crashes, stop and look both ways, wait and watch for pedestrians, go slow, be alert, and don't get hurt. Um, and then we have the same testimonial. I won't read this one, but um, because it's the same as what you see on the posters, it's the, the announcer telling the um, testimonial story with the same concluding message here. Um, and here you can see uh, this is the message from Motor Vehicle Administration, Baltimore Metropolitan Council, and Johns Hopkins University, be more street smart.com. So we're also able to use the BMC's website as a place to go for more information, which is also really important. So uh, briefly, how are we evaluating the campaign? Um, well, as I, this second part of the campaign is running through August. Um, we are tracking pedestrian incidences in our target audience, in our target area. Um, we've done the baseline online survey, which I shared some results um, with you earlier. And then we're repeating the online survey to look for changes in knowledge and attitudes, awareness of the campaign at both the end of phase one and then again at the end of phase two. We also are going to be doing another video recording. Don't tell anybody if you see them walking around here. <laughs> we won't tell you when, um, but to look at the outcomes after the end of phase two in terms of actual observed behaviors. So um, our midterm survey, um, I have a few minutes to share some selected results from that. Who responded to it? What did they say the effect of the campaign was? And what was their overall reaction to it? So this table shows you the comparison between our baseline um, survey respondents and our midterm survey respondents. We had 2,600, almost 2,700 respondents to the midterm. Um, these are different samples. There may be some overlap. We have no way to know. Um, but it's just two cross-sectional surveys. And there really aren't very ma any real differences um, substantial differences in the um, characteristics of the respondents. We had perhaps more people from the School of Public Health at baseline than at the midterm, um, but pretty much, um, and we had more walkers at the, at the baseline than midterm. Um, but still a lot of travel around here um, in both samples. So some of the highlights, 84% saw or heard the campaign messages, which is phenomenal. That is really good reach. 70% said their overall reaction was positive. 74% said they changed their thinking. 64% said they changed their behavior. So let's look at each of these just uh, a little bit more detail. So in terms of overall reaction, 2,200 respondents, um, you can see we had 70% um, positive, 26% uh, were neutral, and only 4% were negative. So um, that's great between the positive and the neutral. It's good to know that the, that other 30% was not negative. Um, so then we asked about their reactions. And in terms of the people who had a positive reaction, we asked them you know, to indicate which of these things they thought um, about the campaign. And 76% thought it was inf informative, 44% effective, 41% persuasive, um, et cetera. You can read compelling, provocative, and then um, some others. So uh, that gives us a good idea of how people were reacting to what they saw. But we were also very interested in people who said um, it was a negative reaction. Again, this was only 4%, 94 people, so it's a very small number, which is good. Um, but what they didn't like was that it was too graphic. Um, they thought it would be ineffective. A third um, thought it was disturbing. A quarter thought it was silly, and, and very few people thought it was unclear. So at least it was clear, um, <laughs> which is good. So this is good feedback for us in terms of um, thinking about whether we sort of hit the nail on the head with the approach that was suggested by the focus groups. And you know, time will tell in terms of changes in behavior. Um, people who said that it changed their thinking, I didn't know that pedestrian accidents were so common. Um, 
I'm more aware. I noticed how many pe other people were not aware. This is important um, in terms of thinking about whether you as an individual can impact others. Um, if you're talking to other people, if you're noticing other people, it expands the impact or the, um, the spread of the campaign message. Um, I don't trust cars that will, that will see you or stop for you just because you're crossing the street, and I take pedestrian safety much more seriously now. People who said that changed their behavior, I don't use my cell phone when walking to and from school, I'm taking more time to check the intersections. And a driver said I'm allowing more pedestrians to cross whether they have the right of way or not, and I look both ways even if I do have the right of way. So these are some really interesting and um, um, provocative findings. We're just starting to look at the data in any detail, so uh, you saw it here first, more to come. Um, so I would just summarize or conclude by saying that I think um, there are three, three areas where there are a lot of lessons, I think, to be learned for other campaigns around safety topics. Um, one is the collaboration, which is, I think, what I started with. None of this would have been possible without collaboration from lots of different disciplines, from you know, a social marketing expert um, to the um, you know, epidemiologists and all of the different people who contributed throughout this process, and the Baltimore Metropolitan Council, who we couldn't have done it without in terms of our reach. Um, in terms of leadership, I mentioned this. Um, again, having the leadership of your organization from the highest level of your school to the highest level of your university um, made this really possible. Um, and then finally, lessons learned about the messages. Many people um, say, well, you know, you really, sh you, you shouldn't scare people. It's not going to work. Um, and actually, you know, our, our experience as well as experiences in other uh, topic areas and issues is that's not necessarily always true. And our focus groups led us to this conclusion that this is what people needed in order to have um, a reaction that would get them to pay attention. And the idea is if you're going to raise people's fear, which um, in some cases I guess we did with, with our more graphic approaches, um, in order for that to work you have to also make sure that people feel like what you want them to do is going to be effective and that they can actually do it. And so what we did was combine that fear appeal with uh, the idea of what you can do. Stop, wait, go slow, be alert, don't get hurt. Um, and the testimonials would um, contribute to that to get people to pay attention to that message and, and change their behavior and thus reduce their, their threat risk. So we learned that firsthand, which was interesting because it's sort of something that we learn in class and um, you know it's really interesting to see it play out. And of course, the rest of our evaluation will tell the final part of the story. Um, but that's what I can share today and thank you very much. Well, thank you both very much. Um, for people, now we're going to take questions from both the live audience and also the online, online audience for both speakers. And people who are watching online, uh, you can email, you can uh, click the link on your screen or send your email to maphtc at jhu.edu. For people in the live audience, um, we're a little shorthanded today. We usually have someone with a microphone to hand to you. So if I can ask you to come to the microphone, um, which people are always a little more resistant to do, but if you could please, it would be a big help. And to um, only ask questions at the microphone so that the people online uh, can hear you. So I'll start with the live audience. Um, does anyone? Have a question right now? Sir, you can just go right. There's one right there at that end. Thank you. And you just push it up to on, and you're good to go. Um, is this working? OK. Um, so my question is to Andrea. Um, and the question is about behavior change in large populations. Um, so I come from India, and we have a certain free spirit when it comes to using the roads. We walk everywhere we want, and we drive whatever way we want. And I notice the same free spirit about Baltimore. But 
I have been to other places where I, it just amazes me that people just stand on the side of the street and wait for the light to turn before they cross the street, even though it's empty. And I keep asking myself, what does it take to change somebody like me? Because I'm deeply resistant of that change myself. You know, it takes everything for me to adapt to that behavior in the new city. So my question is, have we ever seen a population go from, especially for pedestrians, go from being, you know, walking everywhere to being relatively uh, regimented in how they use the roads? And if so, over what period of time does it play out? Does it play out in months, years? How long do these interventions take? And what do those interventions tend to be? Are they advertising to them, social marketing, or is it m something else? I don't think that's just a question for me, <laughs> Mr. Akundi. <laughs> but I, I, I can start. Um, well, when when we looked at other programs in, in putting this one together, um, we didn't find um, an example that would answer your question empirically. Um, I think that what we know more generally is that it usually requires the, all three of the E's, education, engineering, and enforcement, and then it becomes a cultural norm. I mean, if you go to California, for example, where people get tickets for jaywalking and, and driving badly, um, and they have education, and they have roads that the signs give you a chance to cross without cars coming at you, you know, you find a whole different um, culture. And that's one of the things we were really concerned with here is because as a as a neighborhood and as a school community we have people from all over the country all over the world who like you say come from very different backgrounds and experiences in the road environment so I think it's a long process and I think that you know what we want to do is make sure that people are at least aware that they need to be careful here um, and and pay attention so I, did I answer around your question enough <laughs> Point. I think that's an excellent question, and I'm, I'm from originally from India too, and um, I am still afraid to cross the street anywhere, either India or here. I, I'm still afraid, but I think what's happened though is, I mean, Seattle I think is a good example of a city where people do follow the the rules, follow the laws, and it's amazing when you go to a place like Seattle and you know you're about to step into the crosswalk and cars stop for you, even whether or not you have the right of way. So I think this definitely it's possible to change the the, the culture. Uh, how long it takes, that's a very good question. I, you know, we may have to look into that and see in places like Seattle and Chicago and other cities, you know, what was it like 10 years or 15 years or 20 years ago and what have they done? I'm sure law enforcement had a big role to play in it. I think education, we can always put, put our education programs, bringing that law enforcement support. Montgomery County right now is actually working on a really good program. Um, Jeff Dunkel is the uh, lead there. And, and we're starting to learn some lessons about how you know they're actually enforcement is leading the way and education is supporting that. So um, I think I think we're going to start to see some of those changes. But how long it takes? That's a very good question. We have to wait and see how long it takes to change. Okay, um, this is actually my question, um, and I guess it goes to you, Andrea. In the campaign, um, was there any consideration of the dual role that people on campus play? For example, I am on Monument Street making a left turn onto Washington Street, so I'm a driver. But then when I walk from, come from Washington Street to the Wall Street building, I'm a pedestrian. And I've observed um, before the campaign, but especially since the campaign, that sometimes you see the same people who are being very aggressive <laughs> driving, and then you see them walking, and they're continuing that. So I don't know if that's a unique situation where uh, at least the campus people are both drivers and pedestrians. Uh, that's a really interesting point. We didn't have anything specific to that point other than trying to message both the driver and the pedestrian separately. But I'm glad you mentioned that because I forgot to mention that we also have what um, is called special traffic enforcement officers, which you may have seen STEOs um, at high traffic times at that particular intersection um, because of the problem that we had there. Uh, so they're there directing traffic, with uh, directing the pedestrians and directing the cars to sort of help control it. And th there may be an additional enforcement effort sometime over the summer. Um, as well, in terms of getting the um, law enforcement to issue uh, warnings. So there'll be a little bit more on the enforcement side coming up. 
Okay, any other questions from the live audience now? No, okay, are you, you're, oh, you're just scratching your arm, you're not raising your hand, okay. <laughs> well, we have a couple of more from online. Um, one is, um, how does better public transportation, such as subways and light rail, impact on um, traffic injuries and death statistics? Kind of a broad question, but how how is effective is that? Hmm. That is that's tough to pin down too, because um, we don't really have any um, specific data. But I think in general, I mean, we're we're starting to see um, a, a shift towards a much more multimodal uh, form of thinking. You know, we're trying to accommodate transit and bicyclists and pedestrians. So I th I think as you make those changes and we focus less on the on the vehicle. Hopefully, you would start to see some of the uh, interactions reduced, and that may lead to fewer crashes. Um, but again, we don't have any data. I don't have any data to go by, but that's a good question. Can I um, sure. build off of that to just talk about another um, initiative that's related to that that we're very excited about, and um, that is the active transport initiatives of people. We worked with the New York City Health Department that had put together active design guidelines to try to get people to use um, more public transport, more um, active transport, um, and how could you design the urban environment to promote that, um, which is great. Uh, and that was targeting engineers and um, urban planners and folks like that. And they, um, we worked with them from the injury center to make a supplement that talked about how do we do that and promote safety at the same time. So I think yes, public transportation may reduce. Well, you know, we'll reduce the number of cars, but then you have to get people to that public sure, transportation. Right. And so how do you how do you get people to do that and be more physically active by designing in safety strategies at the same time? Time, thinking about the traffic controls and where the pedestrians are going to be um, and all of those kinds of issues. So there's a big opportunity, in my opinion, for public health and injury prevention to really bring together this whole idea of um, less reliance on the cars, more reliance on active transport, but doing it in a way that we don't, you know, turn couch potatoes into trauma patients. Okay. Um, another question from online is, um, and this is more of a, of a broad planning question, it looks like, um, how, how can planners accommodate the intersection of pedestrians, cars, and bicycle riders, and bicycle paths? And what kinds of challenges does um, an emphasis now on, on bicycles for environmental reasons, how does that fit in, particularly in Baltimore City, where we don't have a lot of bike paths? You want me to go first? Okay. Um, so we work closely. In fact, I think in, in your introduction, we um, you talked about how I'm involved in um, traffic signal operations, for example. So when when designers, when engineers are looking at a, at an intersection, they are looking to provide time not only for vehicles to get through the intersection as efficiently as possible, but something that I think we haven't done well in, in past years is to provide sufficient time for pedestrians, uh, for example, to cross the intersection. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion lately about providing all red faces so pedestrians can cross it. All vehicles and all approaches come to a halt so you, pedestrians can move across any of the um, legs of the intersection. Um, Traffic engineers have been resistant to those types of things just because it, it would cause more delay to vehicles, and, and I think that is changing now. That, that mindset is slowly starting to change. Say we need to, especially in an urban environment, we need to prioritize movements for pedestrians and and bicyclists. Now, as far as accommodating bicyclists in bicycle lanes, um, I think ba Baltimore City has done a really good job in, in providing accommodations along certain roads where they had the right of way. To, um, to put bike lanes, and I think we've now reached the end of that particular process. Now we need to take the next step and start to take away some lanes and put bike lanes in place, and that's gonna be a little bit of a challenge because we, we have uh, competing demands and, and the number of vehicles that are coming in. Um, so I, I think there is definitely a, a trend in that direction. Um, it'll, take, it'll take a few more years before we fully uh, 
um, accommodate all of those users, but we're definitely working on those. Several groups are working on that. Okay. Um, no one looks like they're getting up in the live audience, so we'll go um, to online. Um, this question is for Andrea, and it's a question about um, booster campaigns for um, this pedestrian safety campaign. Are there plans after um, the closing, and I guess it was the end of August or September, to then have periodic um, booster education or or police officers to keep to keep this in people's minds. Um, yes, I'm sure there will be. Um, the pedestrian safety task force that um, Dean Schlegel is leading is continuing to meet and um, continuing to look at the data, not just from the surveys, but from the incidents that, that do or don't happen. And looking for, we're working um, with Baltimore City on, and you know pursuing ideas about engineering changes and continuing to work with the STOs to have um, enforcement. And then we'll be looking at the results of all of our um, um, data, the videos, the surveys, et cetera, and regroup, I think, in the fall. One thing we're definitely going to do is continue to have um, in orientation when students come on. Um, we'll, we'll definitely include pedestrian safety as part of what the new students um, get. And, and maybe new employees would be, uh, if we could do that too, somehow incorporate that into what new employees get, that would be great. And we'll continue to have the Street Smart campaign um, uh, into the foreseeable future as long as we have support from the Highway Safety Office. So we'll certainly bring whatever resources we can to this region as well, this area, um, you know, whether you have the continued support. I'm sure you'll continue to get some support as well, but we'll we definitely so. have. <laughs> if anybody out there has, <laughs> has a line on that. <laughs> um, yes, to be sure of support. <laughs> Um, there, there's a question about coordination um, regionally, for example, with this campaign, which, you, you know, there was a lot of planning and thought and, and expense, whether um, there's going to be any coordination with other universities, area universities um, in the Baltimore area, and I guess more largely with um, College Park, mm -hmm. or even, or universities throughout the state. Yeah. So, in fact, just yesterday we had a Baltimore City Safety Task Force meeting. You had Ernie Lehrer, who's with the Highway Safety Office. He runs the Safety Task Force. And, and through th this type of collaboration, um, a couple of universities came to the table. Uh, so la yesterday we had MICA, the Maryland Institute mm -hmm. of College of Art, and University of Baltimore at the table. And they're interested in, in having some resources deployed around their campuses. Um, Towson University has, has some um, challenges around their campus. So they've asked us to come in and um, give them a hand. So uh, we're starting to see that happening. College Park, because they're part of the Washington region, they'll, they'll be um, with the group in D.C. Um, but I think in the Baltimore region, we'll, we'll certainly work with several of these um, educational institutions to um, help them uh, in whatever way we can to promote the campaign. And I think one of the things I didn't put on the lessons learned, I probably should have, was that um, you know this isn't going to be a one-size-fits-all um, effort. And when we collaborate with others around the state, I think we have to um, bear in mind whether there are differences in the culture or the environment or um, the, a the ages, uh, the mix of the population that's um, at issue. Um, so for example, Rhodes Scholar worked great over on the Homewood campus, but it wouldn't have made sense over here because we don't have have you know a big campus of undergrads we have a different mix of people so I think as we move forward one of the things we'd like to share is the process right. that we went through so that people in other areas can can um, also do that to tailor what they do for their their constituents okay um, here's another um, very practical question are speed bumps bumps effective in decreasing accidents um, sure, they're effective in reducing speed. So um, when you uh, t eliminate speed or reduce speed, you reduce the, uh, the at least the the impact of crashes. So I I would think they they would help. But I think where those um, there are some challenges is in environments where you have uh, emergency vehicles that, for example, need to get to a certain place. So um, I think the jurisdictions take a close look at where you can use speed bombs, uh, but they're certainly effective in reducing speed. Okay. And crashes. Um, here's another question. Um, 
oftentimes people drive more aggressively when they feel rushed due to lack of time or when they're running late. Um, were any of the survey participants, and this is for you, Andrea, asked about stress levels while, while driving? Oh, that's a, that's a mm. great question, and I don't think we had any items that would get at that. Um, maybe we do, but I will go back and check. That's a good question. Yes, yeah, great. Everyone here I know, both probably pedestrians and drivers, are always in a hurry. Um, We're always stressed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there a different state? <laughs> um, any questions from the audience, the live audience? Okay, then we'll go back online. We have a couple of more. Um, one question is about um, the, compo the components of when there is an injury or fatality, the investigation or investigation of near misses, and how that feeds into prevention programs, particularly the near misses. Oh, that's another great question, and uh, maybe that's something if we get to do focus groups at the end of at the end of this, which right now we're not planning, but maybe that would be a good thing to um, really focus on because it's a uh, you know it's a lot of information that's untapped as far as I, I know. I mean, even just getting data on the actual pedestrian crashes is is a bit of a challenge. So it would be very interesting to do some more work understanding um, the similarities and differences between um, actual crash crashes and near misses. If somebody wants to do that for a capstone or practicum, maybe we can work that out. Okay, um, any questions? I think we've come to the end of our questions from online. Um, I have actually one more question particular to the campaign. <laughs> this is, uh, I, I was just curious um, that whether the campaign purposefully didn't include um, attention to the signals and the laws in the sense that I notice that many people around here do stop, they do look, and they do cross against the light when there aren't cars coming. Um, and also I notice that specifically from Washington Street Garage, people cross in the middle of the street um, to go to the medical school. W were those specific, like obeying the, the sign and the law, not the focus? Or was that something you were trying to get also, or were you trying to just get the alertness and awareness to look? Right, right. No, I get your question. That's a great question. Um, we actually um, thought a lot about the law, um, trying to make sure people understood what the law was, and we realized very quickly that it's very complicated. Um, and that trying to communicate the law <laughs> would probably just be more of a distraction than a help. Um, and that it would be better to focus on getting people to pay attention to the cross signs and the crosswalks. Um, so that's the way we went with regard to understanding and knowing the law. With regard to the question about, yes, we stand there, we see there is an, a car in sight, and so we cross, that's one of the things that um, we're starting to to tease apart in looking at the videotapes because you know we see in the videotape people crossing against the light but there's no car so at what point do you say um, this was you know a near miss or it was an unsafe behavior so um, we're, we're really trying to get at that a little bit more by going back to the literature and also looking at our videotapes one of the one of the materials that we uh, provide to law enforcement um, is a card that has the driver laws and pedestrian laws on the on either side. Um, it's not a citation, it's just something that um, an officer can hand out to a pedestrian who may be crossing in a dangerous situation. So um, that's one way, but like Andrea said, it's, it's very confusing and uh, it's, it's hard to get that word out to, uh, to the public. Okay, well I wanna thank you both for a really um, interesting presentation. And we love to bring different kinds of topics that affect public health um, to, to our listeners. Um, today's PowerPoints will be posted on the MAPHTC website probably by tomorrow, and the archived webcast will be up um, in about a week to two weeks. And also, um, for people interested in this topic, we do have an archive Grand Rounds on distracted driving. 
um, from last year that you might be interested in looking at. And I wanted to let our regular viewers know that we will not be having um, a Grand Rounds in August and to keep your eyes open for emails from us about um, future events. Thank you so much.